Jason's looking rough. <laughs> Jason has been working the head catch for pregnancy, checking 189 head of cows today, and he smells like it. <laughs> I look good compared to how I smell. <laughs> Welcome to Cowboy Church. Right? <laughs> Everybody good? Great. Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, I didn't really even think I was going to make it on time, so I hired me to fill in, all right? And, uh, you know, you guys have heard me say this before, but... You know, cowboy church people think, well, you got to have a cowboy hat or you got to be a cowboy. Some of you say, is it even just for men or what? I, but I always say that cowboy is not a job description. It's a, it's a, it's a how you do a job. It's a, it's an attitude. It's the way you do something. You know, it's like the cowboy way. You know, it's, it's like even if something's tough, you're gonna do it. It's a cowboy. Even if it's going to hurt, you climb on anyway, right? I mean, nobody else wants to do it. It's going to hurt. It's going to be hard. Cowboy going to step up and do it, right? Yep. You could be a lawyer and be a cowboy. You could be a school teacher and be a cowboy. You could be a banker and be a cowboy. You could be a cowboy and all kinds of stuff, right? In your job description. Is there any cowboys in here? Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> well, I, I said all that just because I want you to meet my man, Chris. I naughty, I naughty, I naughty. This is Cowboy right here. Yeah. I want you guys to meet him right quick. I've been wanting you to meet him anyway. You you guys know him already, but I want you to meet him officially because because he's borderline famous already. <laughs> I want you to get get acquainted with him before he gets plum famous. All right. This guy right here. Is God is doing some awesome stuff. I mean, Dark Horse Ministries. Dark Horse Ministries. Doesn't that sound like it ought to just be partnered up with Cowboy Church? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, God's doing some awesome stuff. We've already been doing some stuff. Uh, these guys are the rubber meeting the road right here. They go after the folks that church don't want nothing to do with. They're scared of sending folks to rehab, getting them off the streets, getting them out of jail. This good stuff, and God's done some, doing some amazing things in this guy's life right here, and I just wanted to share it with you tonight, so uh, I just want to warn you, Dan Muller was the last one to wear that time, so <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> all right, all right, hey, I'll share your heart. I definitely will. All right. How's everybody doing this evening? Great. I want y'all to give yourselves a round of applause for the church. It's been a game changer for me, I can tell you that much. Uh, it's apparent that I don't exactly fit in, right? But I do fit in. And y'all made me feel comfortable, made me feel welcome. So I, I thank you for that. I praise God for that. Thank you. Can I turn down my volume just a little bit? I feel like I'm screaming at myself. Y'all can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, my name is Chris Ionati. My friends call me Dago uh, for obvious reasons. We can't tell by the last name. <laughs> my dad was Italian. Uh, and if it's also not obvious, I'm not from here. If you can't tell from my accent. I am, I am from up north. I am from Chicago. Uh, I've lived here for the last five years. And uh, it's just been a life-changing experience. In the beginning, I asked God, what in the heck are you doing sending me to Marion, Illinois? <laughs> See, I almost got a twang partway now. My family, my family back home makes fun of me now. <laughs> what happened? Do you uh, say y'all here I do say y'all, yeah. So, uh... When Jason called me about three hours ago, thanks for the heads up, buddy. <laughs> uh, of course, I'm going to jump, jump at the opportunity because this is this is what God put me on this earth to do is just to share my heart. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a, a pastor. I'm just one of his children, one of his sons, and uh, I'm here to share my heart and what he's done in my life, and hopefully it inspires and motivates someone else, and, and uh, that'd be a blessing if he did. Uh, I often tell people, because of the tattoos and because of the motorcycle jacket and and all that kind of stuff. Don't look at the differences. Try to look for the similarities in our stories uh, because I believe that there's plenty of similarities between all of us, okay? Amen. I'll just jump right in and uh, 
share with you, first of all, uh, the way I was raised, okay? I shared with you the fact that I was born and raised in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, and uh, my father was a Vietnam veteran, and my mother was uh, a hippie back in those days. <laughs> How they wound up together, I don't know, but it, it, uh, it worked out quite well. Uh, you know, I don't want to say anything negative about my father, but my experience with him was not a very good one, okay? He left my mother and I before I was two years old. So I don't have any recollection of him being in the home or disciplining me or, you know, anything like that. But when he did come around, uh, he was very abusive, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally. <coughs> my mother, I witnessed my mother being beat uh, on a fairly regular occasion, you know. And uh, I'll never forget seeing that. I'll never forget that rage that I felt inside when I did see that. Because it was just me and my mom. I wanted to protect her, you know. And there was nothing I could do. And this man that I didn't know that I was told was my father was hurting her and in the process hurting me as well. My mother was uh, an alcoholic as well. She worked two jobs to try and keep a roof over our head, keep food on the table. And I didn't know that she was an alcoholic at that time. But looking back now and uh, some of the behavior that I saw and the people that I was left with sometimes, uh, I realize now that she did have uh, an issue with alcoholism. And uh, I still love them both to death. They were young, and I, I don't use that as an excuse for the reason why I turned out the way I did or why I did some of the stupid things I did. It's not their fault. I, I made my own decisions, so please don't take that the wrong way. I'm trying to give you some background to build up to what made me who I am today. Um, growing up, it was rough. Obviously, we didn't have much money. I respect the heck out of my mom for working all the time, and uh, I would spend after school, either by myself at home, doing my homework and trying to take care of myself, or I would actually go to my mom's work. She worked in a restaurant. And I would spend time in the kitchen with the guys in the kitchen learning how to cook and how to uh, say nasty bad words in Spanish. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but the love for food and the love for that hospitality business uh, was, was born in me. So to this day, cooking is something that I truly love and I'm really passionate about. And, uh, I learned about a work ethic, too, at an early age. So, I mean, there were some, some positives in that. Uh, I did pretty good growing up until I got into high school. You know, I played football and baseball, all that kind of stuff. And started when I was about eight years old and never really had any issues, you know, until high school come around. The, the neighborhood that we lived in, we went to high school with another neighborhood, okay? That was like mixing oil and water. Uh, and I'm sure some of you know what that's like. I don't know what it's like up here in Goreville in another town maybe, but uh, it was scary. We were only 20 minutes away from the city of Chicago, uh, from downtown proper, and it was pretty dangerous. There was a lot of gangs in our neighborhood, a lot of drugs being sold, a lot of violence, a lot of people fighting. Guns didn't start coming out until I got into high school, okay? Anyone having a gun or shooting a gun was very, very rare and unheard of. Uh, I was a freshman in high school, and a kid, Jason, that I grew up with, playing football with, uh, was shot and murdered right in front of his entire family. Just sitting on his front porch, um, enjoying an afternoon, evening, and uh, an enemy of his came out of the bushes across the street and chased him down the alley and shot him in cold blood right in front of his entire family. And uh, when that happened, my life changed, obviously. You know, you would think that if you see or witness something like that or experience something like that, that it would... It would scare you straight. Say, I'm not going that way. You know, that's that's crazy. Not me. I want a little fixed gold. Instead, I wanted to dive in deeper. I wanted to get revenge on the person that did that to my friend. And I wanted to dedicate my life to making sure that no one else hurt another one of my friends or anyone else I cared about for as long as I lived. And I did that. And I was good at it. Um, I joined my first street gang. I was 14 years old. And... The repercussions that come along with that, legal trouble, obviously, behavior issues at school, getting kicked out, suspended in school, in school for fighting and things of that nature, and selling drugs in school, and coming to school high or doing drugs while I was in class, you know what I mean, like it, it wasn't good. So those repercussions led to my mother sending me to go live with my father on the south side of Chicago. A man I didn't know, a man I was deathly afraid of, the only thing I knew of him was anger and violence and, and just negativity. Um, 
So I went to go live with him down there. I made new friends real quick because of my behavior, because of my background and where I came from. And uh, I had no fear at that time. I was heavily induced under drugs and alcohol. Um, and then I got introduced to heroin. And I think I lived with my dad for about a week before I met somebody. That same day that I met that gentleman, we were in the projects on the west side of Chicago, buying heroin, buying cocaine. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even know what I was doing. But I wanted to be accepted. I just wanted to be loved. I wanted to feel welcomed. And, and uh, I allowed that person, those people that I was surrounded by, and that drug to take over my entire life. And I didn't know it was taking over my life until I tried to stop. And I couldn't stop. And when I tried to stop, I got uh, tremendously sick. Um, so I started to rob. I started to steal. I stopped working. Uh, any, any modicum of character or morals were out the window. I would do whatever it took to get high. And I know some of you in this room <clears throat> can identify. And uh, that, that's a horrible place to be. But it taught me a lot. I was 17 years old, and I was arrested for a residential burglary. I was looking at 4 to 15 years in the penitentiary, and found myself in a big boy jail. This is no more juvenile stuff, no more slaps on the wrist. Cook County Jail in Chicago is hell on earth, okay? It is, uh, it should be demolished. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. 17 years old, my first day there. I watched someone get carried out on a stretcher dead. And when I asked the guard what happened, he got killed over coffee. He made some bets, gambling, playing cards for coffee, couldn't pay up, and he was killed. And I was a kid. What am I doing here? Um, and I was there for nine months, fighting my case and trying to survive. If you're not an organized crime figure, if you're not in an organized gang, you're a victim. So any ideas of me living that lifestyle um, went out the window. And in turn, when I left, I was the same person, only worse. I had learned new skills. I had met new people. And uh, so this cycle, I, I, hate, I hate dwelling too much on all the negative stuff. This is not a horror story. I'm not trying to uh, brag or talk about all the awful things I did or the awful person I was. I'm trying to show you the contrast that you'll see here in a minute of how low I was at one point. Okay? Suicide was a great idea at that time. If I would have had the courage to do it, I would have. But I didn't have the courage to do it. And uh, multiple trips to jail, um, never getting sentenced to prison for whatever reason. I don't think I would do very well. I'm, I'm skinny. <laughs> I'm really kind of slim. But uh, thank God I never had to do state time. Judges always showed me mercy. And they started sending me to drug rehabilitation. And that was a blessing. I started to learn more about myself, about my disease, about what was causing me to make these stupid bonehead decisions over and over again. And then I heard about God. Awesome. But the problem was, Jeff, their idea of God, they said it didn't have to be God, the real living God that we know. If you're uncomfortable with that, it's okay. You can trust in the doorknob. They literally said that. Or I can trust on you guys. I can trust on the group. A bunch of other humans that are messed up like me. So that didn't work out very well. You know, I kept relapsing. I could not kick this habit. Um... I think it was 2008. I had a son. I was married. He was two years old. My entire life growing up, I said, when I get older and I have a kid, I'm not going to be anything like my dad was. I'm going to be totally different. So fast forward to 2008, I'm back in jail again for a possession case. And I'm looking at doing some serious time now. My probation has been revoked from all my previous cases. And uh, I sat in my jail cell that night, and I thought about my life. <laughs> If I don't get choked up, that's all gone, okay? Uh, I was exactly like him. I treated everyone I loved like trash. I was a drug addict. I was abusive. I was violent. I had a record just like my dad. And, and it hit me square in the forehead. You got to do something. You got to do something you ain't never done before. And that something I'd never done before was pick up a Bible, ask questions about God, who God is. And I never gave my life up. I never let go. It's like, oh, it's me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to figure it out on my own. That pride, that ego was killing me, literally and spiritually. 
I started going to Bible studies in jail. I started to hear about the Word, and when I did get out, I went to a church. I just found the first church I, in my neighborhood, and I went. And it was great. It felt really good. Valentine's Day, 2008, I gave my life to Christ. Awesome, right? Yeah, it didn't last very long. <laughs> it didn't last very long at all because I had a lot of questions and I didn't have anyone to answer my questions or tell me the truth. What I was told was just keep reading the Bible and just keep coming to church. And I kept going to church. I kept reading the Bible and I wasn't understanding what I was reading and no one was talking to me when I went to church. And I just felt like there's got to be something more than this. You know? I learned in the program going through AA and NA and all that kind of stuff. Service work was a big priority in that program. They say, you know, you got to give it away in order to keep it. And, and service work was a, was a huge thing. But I always told myself, well, when I'm ready, you know, when I'm in a good enough spot, when I get myself figured out, I'll go and help someone else. <laughs> Y'all, I'm still not ready. <laughs> but, but that doesn't stop me. You know I, mean? right. I still go out and help everyone I can. So let me just zoom through this, okay? Repeated attempts at going to churches, working in bars and restaurants, being a drug addict, working in bars and restaurants is probably not a good idea. Uh, they're very prevalent, especially in downtown Chicago. Uh, but it was, it was an interesting life, you know, the party lifestyle, going to the nightclubs after work and the girls and all that kind of stuff. But here I am, I'm trying to find my way to God, but instead I'm being pulled away the opposite direction. And uh, if you don't change, nothing changes, right? You always get what you always got. You always do what you always did. So I had a job opportunity to come down here. Like I said, uh, a fellow I'd actually waited on in the restaurant that would come to town periodically, told me about his job working on the oil pipelines, and I told him how I used to sell real estate in the past, and he seemed to think I would be good at this job. And uh, he gave me a job offer and said, meet me in Marion, Illinois. And so there I go. I'm in Marion, Illinois. I have no idea where I'm at or what I'm doing. He trained me for three days, and he left. I was on my own. <laughs> to cover from the Mississippi River to Seymour, Indiana. And uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I have, still to this day, Jason will tell you, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm in my truck worshiping, driving, singing, listening to sermons and just getting it in by myself. And, and that's what I needed. I needed to get away from the loud and the busy and the, and the hoopla. I needed to just be alone, just me and God. And uh, I gave Jesus another try when I came down here, okay? I was miserable. I went to a church. It was not denominational. I said, I know it's not a Baptist church or a Methodist church or a Lutheran church. I don't know about all of that. And I got saved. And it felt great. I had that warm, fuzzy feeling again. And I was back in that same rut. Well, now what? I'm going to church every Sunday. And this sin, this stuff that I want to do, the drinking, the partying, women chasing, uh, is still inside me. I still want to do this. And I'm fighting it. It's making me miserable. And when I would go and talk to my pastor, he would he would uh, harp on me pretty good about it, you know. You're a Christian now. You ain't supposed to do that stuff anymore. That's not a part of you anymore. Well, I'm telling you that it is. <laughs> it's very real, dude. It's a very real struggle I'm telling you about. And you're not you're not giving me any answers here. Uh, I heard right. I heard a message one day that did stick with me. It was about discipleship. And the idea of taking what I've learned and pouring into someone else. Not teaching someone, but living life with someone else. And pouring into them. And I like that. Something clicks. Okay, so where am I going to meet these people? Because everyone here in church was in church with me, so everybody got it figured out. So I'm not going to find someone to pour into sitting next to me, because they're in the right place already. Can't go to a nursing home, because I'll probably scare half the people. <laughs> right? Where am I going to go? And I'm telling you clear as day, I've never had an experience with the Holy Spirit before. And I've never heard God speak to me. Not audibly, not anyway. I just saw a vision of a jail cell. A jail cell I had been in before. And uh, it was like a light bulb went off. Oh, go to the prisons. I'm surrounded by prisons down here. Maybe this is why God sent me down here. You know what I mean? That makes sense now. Now I get it. I understand why I'm here. And, and so I started going to the prisons and trying to apply to get in. And they looked at my record and the people I was affiliated with. And they're like, you're crazy. You're not, you're 
not coming in. And, and uh, I would get discouraged and want to give up. Like, now what? Um, but instead, my faith was starting to grow. And I, I went back anyways. And these guys would be like, what are you doing? We already told you you can't come in. I said, listen, I want you to give me just five minutes of your time. I want to talk to you. Okay, I'll talk to you. Be here at this time. And they made me wait two hours, two and a half hours, three hours. I wouldn't leave. I just sat there. He walked past me. I said, isn't that, isn't, hello? I'll be right here. Whenever you're ready. The uh, warden at Vienna got tired of letting me sit there wait. And finally sat me down and talked to me. And I told him my story, and I told him about my journey that I was on, and how desperately I needed to share my faith with someone else and try to pour into someone else's life. Otherwise, all I'm focused on is myself, and me focusing on myself is not a good thing. Too much time about myself, thinking about my past, thinking about my mistakes, thinking about my failures, causes me to beat myself up, beat myself up to the point that I would destruct myself. That I would destroy myself. He told me, I'll give you one chance. If you bring any drugs in this place, you do one thing wrong, you're going to go from a volunteer to a resident. And I said, that, that's absolutely fair. And so I went. I went back to my church. I said, guys, I got, I got accepted into my and I can go and volunteer. Come on, who's coming with me? <laughs> I said, wait a second, weren't you on stage talking about discipleship and how we need to go out and how we need yes. to serve and baptize right. in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? And right. yes. What are you guys doing? You're just hanging out on Sundays? Yeah. You're sending people to Haiti, that's excellent, but what about our own backyard? Yeah. Yeah. So that's I went right. by myself, and I went every single Sunday for six months, and I shared my story, and I talked about Celebrate Recovery, and I talked about the 12 Steps, and I encourage these guys and I didn't feel like I was in any, any position to be teaching anybody anything but I heard a statement once that stuck with me and it, it's been on the back of some of our t-shirts since then is God doesn't call the qualified he qualifies the call That's right. That's right. and I That's felt right. that I was called and I had a responsibility to go and share a message regardless of what I thought about myself God apparently thought I was pretty slick and thought something of me <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have much help and that was okay my time, I went through one class. 33 men gave their life to Jesus Christ through my, through my escapades on Sundays. And the, cool, the cool thing was the warden came in one day. She comes in with white shirts. You know, those are like the, the top dogs. Those are the brats, right? And she's just a little bitty woman. And she comes in, and she walks up to me, and she says, Come here, I want to talk to you. What do I do? <laughs> I don't know what you're doing here. So with these guys are going back to their cell blocks and they're starting Bible studies. Thank you, Jesus. That's how I knew I was, I was on the right path. I was following the calling. You know, when you see results, you know you're on the right path. Uh, but I felt like there was more I needed to do. It's great to go into prisons, and I, and I love it. That's my passion. That's what I love to do. But there was more. There were more people that were wanting to get involved. When I broke away from that church and I started seeking out true gospel living, true leadership, you know, the real answers. Uh, other people started to want kid to get involved, but they weren't comfortable with going to prisons. And I understand that. If you've never been there, it's it's scary. And I understand that. Some people wanted to go work with the veterans. So my idea was, well, do that. I'll go with you. Let's go talk to the volunteer rep, and, and we'll go do that. And other people wanted to go to the senior citizen homes. Cool, let's do that. We'll go play games and do whatever we want to do. We'll go hang out with them. The children are another one. And, you know, when I got released from prison, my mom didn't want me back at her house. My dad, I didn't want to go back to his house. And I didn't want to go to a halfway house because in Chicago, the halfway houses are in the worst neighborhoods in the city. So I went to a children's home. I was still 17 years old, and I got into this mercy home for boys and girls in downtown Chicago. And I saw the lifestyle that some of these kids, the situation that some of these kids uh, came from, they just broke my soul. You know, they didn't ask to be born with junky parents that didn't take care of them. Um, so the children's home, Mount Vernon, we started out there. We started working with the kids and just hanging out with them. 
Not preaching the gospel to them, just loving them. Just right. living with right. them. Right. And when we pull up on our bikes, man, these kids come pouring out of their houses, man. And it's, it's just an awesome feeling, you know. And that's the other thing, the motorcycles, okay. We get a bad rap sometimes because of our appearance. Some of us do ride motorcycles, you know. Um, I can tell you this, that some of the motorcycle club members that I've met, some of them become like family to me. Some of them, their entire life revolves around trying to help others, but you would never know that by looking at them. So the stereotypes and judging a book by its cover, that's not Jesus. That's not what he would do. Jesus hung out with the sinners. He hung out with the prostitutes. He hung out with the tax collectors. You know? That's right. I don't think he treated the religious folks too kindly. And I don't want to. I don't want to go off like Jason did last week. I'd love to, but I won't believe he hasn't jazzed up for like three days already. Uh, I say that to say this: because in my life, yeah, it wasn't pretty. I wouldn't change a single thing in this world for because it made me to the man I am today. And I can go to people. I'm a frontline ministry guy. I'm not happy unless I'm in the trenches. I won't get my hands dirty. I'm not afraid to walk into a dope house and pull someone out. I'm not afraid to go to a, a, a jail. It don't matter. I'll go wherever i got to go. And, and that's only because of my past. I, I don't sense any fear. Either I'm stupid or I'm brave. Either one, it gets the job done. But, uh, coming here to Cowboy Church revolutionized my life, my outlook on everything. There's no more condemnation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I have such a hard time now when I hear or see other, you know, pastors or other leaders. Uh, <laughs> God, <laughs> if, I, if, if I was talking to another pastor right now that that constantly talked down to their flock. <laughs> that ain't right. That's not Jesus, man. You don't, you don't tell people, if you don't do this, you're not going to heaven. And you need to continue to repent. And you need to, to stop doing that. And listen, once I realize all I have to do is allow God to love me, recognize what Jesus did for me on the cross, right. That's accept right. that, right. allow Him to change Come on. me. Right. Come on. And my job's done. All I gotta do is love others, you know. That's right. That's, That's right. That's right. That's true. And, that, and that freedom has has allowed me, you know, with the, the other addicts that we help sending people to uh, to Florida and to Texas to get help for the treatment. That's a small thing that we do. But watching these folks leave broken, okay, completely lost, like I was, and to see them come back. Yeah with that fresh look on their face and they're asking about God, they want to go to church and you're just watching them change. Man, that is what life is all about. That is what it's all about. So I won't keep babbling. I just want to encourage you all, man, please, um, if you see us, recognize that we're here and, and we love you and, and we hope that you all love us too. We're trying to yes, make a difference do. in our community and we hope that this thing grows and that we continue to multiply, you know, stretch out of Southern Illinois and, and just cross borders and and change lives, you know. Um, I thank you all here at Cowboy Church for welcoming us and welcoming us, <laughs> and letting us come be a part of your services. And uh, uh, it feels like family. We're really grateful. Uh, keep in touch with us on Facebook. You'll see all the events that we do. You're, you're more than welcome. We have a church in Elkville. We're trying to reach out in that area. We also teamed up with Caring Counseling Ministries. We do Bible studies there every other week. Uh, Jason will come poke his head in every now and again, and. And it's just awesome, man. People are just stepping up, taking the lead, and uh, and are making disciples. That's what we're supposed to do, I feel like. So thank you all for your time. I appreciate you. We love you, Chris. <laughs>
you know, however you said that, and said, you need to quit doing that, or you need to stop doing that. You're, you're a Christian now. That's, you're not supposed to be doing any of that. Just, you're not like that anymore. You don't, you don't understand I am, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, religion never could change that. In fact,